Good afternoon and welcome to Conversations on Showing Up for Kids. This is a regular webcast of the Southern Regional Center for Children and Youth with Special Health Care Needs, of which I am the quasi no, I am the director of the Southern Regional Center. I am so excited to have Katie joining us today. Katie Sullenbrand is a parent. She has created her own care preference plan, and we're going to talk about ideas about how you might be able to create your own as well. Katie's a nurse and a homeschooling parent to two children with a variety of disabilities, including ADHD and autism. She enjoys the outdoors as well as staying indoors with her three dogs and a cup of coffee. And I believe that the dogs may occasionally make an appearance during the, the webcast today as my dog may also make an appearance or at least me yelling at my dog to give me a moment to get to the door to let her out because I do not have a remote controlled sliding glass door, which is exactly what I need for the dog that I have, which I never expected to have. So with all that out of the way, um, Katie, I am gonna go ahead and I am going to um, pin you to the screen a little bit here. There we go. Um, and just could you tell us a little bit about your family first to get us to know you a little bit? Sure. So you covered some of it there. Um, I have two kids um, and we homeschool. We were doing that um, even pre-COVID. And so a lot of the world has now gotten kind of a little taste of what all that entails. Um, but otherwise, like you said, I'm also a nurse um, and we have two kids with, like you said, a variety of um, kind of needs and challenges. And so um, I spend a lot of time sort of thinking, researching, um, talking to other parents, you know, just trying to figure out how to um, kind of effectively advocate for my kids in a world that, as I'm sure we can all attest, is not always um, well set up for or, or welcoming to them. So and we know that one of those areas that sometimes tries to be welcoming is the medical realm. I mean, that's, it's full of people that are really caring, that are there because they, they love people, but they sometimes aren't exactly, they don't get it right all the time. And from talking to you before, I think one of the things that began to happen was, was there a way to help them to get it right more of the time with your family? Can you talk a little bit about your interaction with the health system and how you came to wanting them to have more information up front? Yeah, I think that's an accurate way to put it. Um, you know, we, COVID was kind of a turning point for our family because prior to that, it was like we had kind of been gathering this snowball of diagnoses and services and appointments and all these things. And I mean, I knew it felt like a lot to me. I knew that uh, it's my youngest, you know, who primarily has more medical concerns. I knew it was overwhelming to her. Um, she actually has medical PTSD following open heart surgery when she was six. And so um, I knew that things were getting overwhelming. Um, and so the thing that was good about, you know, 2020 for us was that it was just kind of this pause. It was kind of a reset where um, suddenly we had to think a lot more critically. It wasn't like the default was, you know, more was better, more appointments, more everything. It was like, well, which, which of these things are worth the risk, you know, of, of physically going in or which of these things are worth, you know, taking up our time and those kinds of things, which kind of things can be deferred and which need to be done now. And so the, I think the reset that I needed um, was, was realizing that, like you said, the people in the medical community by and large, they're very well intentioned. And being part of that community myself, I think it was hard not to slip into that role when I was at appointments with my daughters of feeling like I know how busy they are. I know how this comes across. Like I know what kind of family we look like. I know what kind of parent I look like. And so, you know, I oh, think for oh, a lot oh of Oh my us, gosh, Katie, it sounds like you didn't want to be that parent. Mm -hmm. we, we all in the realm of special health care needs, we all worry about becoming that parent where everybody sort of rolls their eyes when we walk into the meeting at school or into the health care system and you see people physically want to move away a little bit. And it, it's like they're already ready for a conflict when we're just we're we're not always loaded for conflict. Right. And I have felt, too, you know, that 
there's, like you said, you don't want to be that parent. You don't want the eye rolls. You don't want to be denied, you know, referrals that you need or, you know, medications that you need and things like that. And I also try to be very aware that there are, you know, parents out there from different walks of life who might, you know, face more threat than just an eye roll, you know, in a meeting kind of a thing. And so, you know, I try to keep that in mind and use, um, you know, what privilege we have as far as, you know, whether it's skin color, or education level, or being part of the medical establishment and being able to code switch there a little bit. I try to broaden people's, you know, sense of, um, you know, what, what's to be expected in, in meetings, which is just about anything, I think. And so, like I said, just kind of always trying to, to advocate for the right of, of people to kind of show up in appointment who they are, you know, with the needs and the challenges that they have and not feeling like we're here for help. And so we have to shove all of our other needs for help or all of our other, you know, needs under the rug kind of a thing so that we can just like present this, you know, isolated, here's, here's the problem of the day, you know, recognizing this is a whole person and that, you know, they're going to walk in how they are that day. And that's, that's okay. And there are ways to meet them where they are that don't rely on, you know, the expectation of, you know, a, a quiet, compliant, you know, kind of question and answer session. So were there certain things that, you know, I mean, you as a, you, you have, you know, we would think that you have the, like this insider information um, being part of the medical community, but there are, there are some challenges, even when you were going to see the physician with your children's appointments, what sort of challenges were you facing? What wasn't going right? I think the thing that that I realized when we stepped away for a year and I realized how much more at ease she was and how much more regulated she was, was, you know, it becomes kind of this chicken and an egg situation, whether I think in some cases with school or with healthcare, where it's like, well, this person's really agitated. And so, you know, it looks like they must need, you know, this, these services and this training and all these other types of things. When I think in a lot of cases, it's those interventions or at least how we're going about them that are creating some of the distress and so you know looking at it she ended up needing dental surgery um, during COVID and so it, it was kind of our first you know walk back into that world after I'd sort of had this recognition that you know I'd kind of crossed the line as far as you know I was thinking about advocacy when we were at home and then once we got in the appointment you know, like I said, it was more, well, you know, how can we respect these people's time and how can we let them know like we do appreciate their help and, you know, all these kinds of things. And so getting back on the side of realizing, you know, that really my number one job for her was, was to be her advocate. Um, looking at it through that lens, it became, you know, what everything that's being done in an appointment, it's kind of, you could group it part of the solution or part of the problem. And as you had alluded to at the beginning, there are certain things that I think people think they're being part of the solution. You know, they come, they get down on a kid's level, they're warm and they're chatty and they ask a lot of questions and those types of things. Um, and that feels like part of the solution. And certainly it's better than being rude or, you know, that kind of a thing. But <clears throat> for my child with autism, with PTSD, with all these things, um, actually she found that very dysregulating. She found it very agitating. Um, like I said, for me to look at it and realize, you know, even by first, second grade, you kind of realize like, okay, there's a right answer to these questions. Do you like school? What's your favorite subject? You know, all these types of things. And so that's a lot of um, code to kind of expect of someone that's in a distressing situation to sort of play along with that when that's not the point of, of the appointment. The point of the appointment might be that we need a blood draw or it might be that we need a you know, to look in your ears or whatever. And so if we've used up all of, you know, my kids use the term coping skills a lot, you know, in the disabled words, you hear the term spoons a lot, kind of however you want to think about that bandwidth that we all have that has a limit on it. If we've used that up on small talk that didn't need to happen, if we've used it up asking her to take off her shoes and get on the scale, if we didn't even need a weight today, um, you know, then by the time we get to what it was we needed from the appointment, everybody's, you know, anxiety and irritability is so high. And so, like I said, my goal was to kind of look at it and say, you know, what are some really easy do's and don'ts, um, you know, that we could put kind of in a, in a bullet form and say like, this helps, this doesn't, this helps, this doesn't, because like I said, you know, it's a lot 
in the moment to try to think about that, convey that in a respectful way, you know, get that across. And so for my part, being able to do that on the front end and sort of, you know, troubleshoot ahead of time, you know, like you would a job interview or like you would, you know, a tricky route to work or something like that. Um, I think that made us feel much more confident going in to, you know, as far as being truly her advocates there. And I love the fact that you brought out that the, the interactions weren't necessarily, you know, rude or anything. I mean, this sounds like, you know, this is how you would like your doctors, your nurses, your therapists, your helpers to interact with, with children. The, the problem is, is that not all children are the same and they don't all react the same way. And that sometimes what works, that, that little small talk, building that relationship for some kids, that's very empowering and they get excited and it, it builds them up that someone's connected and other kids, it's just like, ah, what am I supposed to say? I don't know what I'm supposed to say. And it starts to drain their energy mm-hmm. so that by the time, like you said, the important stuff gets around they're already done. Mm-hmm. They have lost their energy. And so helping the provider understand the nuances of your child, of the how can we make this together as a team? How can we make this appointment go best for everybody who is in that room? How can you get the answers you need? And how can my child not leave here in tears and, and tired? So I, I want to go ahead and pull up an example of the, the care plan and put that onto the screen for everybody to show. If you could just sort of walk us through um, the different things that you basically talked about, but some of the do's and the don'ts that, that you had come up with. So give me one moment. Let me see if this is going to work today. It, it sure worked pretty well, seeing how I don't have any sound or anything involved in it. So can you see the, the care plan for Luna, who is not your child? Um, on the screen? I can see it. Can others see it? Good deal. So yeah, I'd be happy to walk through. So, you know, I included a a picture. um, And for me, you know, I tried to choose a picture that showed her looking relaxed and happy. Um, One of the things that I felt, um, you know, again, having a medical background is, you know, that label of autism, it can be sometimes really helpful because sometimes it does help the providers understand why she's not responding to their questions or things like that. But I also feel like oftentimes um, distress just gets marked up to, well, you know, she has autism. And so that's, you know, why she's acting the way she is. And so, like I said, presenting this as a whole person, a person that, that has a relaxed, smiling, you know, happy, content version of herself, because, you know, when they see her, she's, huddled up and under my arm and, you know, all these types of things. And so I think just giving them that visual that like, this is, this is possible for this person versus, you know, this might be a kid who just, this is just their baseline, just resting on happy face. And like I said, that's not necessarily the case. Um, You know, again, being um, part of the medical world, I, I do feel like it's important to express that we do appreciate being there. We appreciate their time. I mean, it's a, it's a hard time to be in healthcare and it has been for a long time and it's only getting worse. And so, like I said, trying to put that out there that, that we appreciate them, we appreciate their efforts, we, re, we appreciate their good intentions. Um, and then kind of bringing the focus to what I think is kind of the crux of the whole thing, which is really, you know, regulation versus dysregulation. And that's the piece that, Um, it's part of why we homeschool, um, you know, just because I think I talk to a lot of people and I hear from a lot of people who are aware of it, but I think it's, it's still kind of a surprisingly new idea out there. I think, again, a lot of it still is very focused in behaviorism. And so, you know, if a child is behaving in a certain way, it's either because we haven't taught them how to behave or because they haven't been rewarded or punished enough into using what they know about how to behave. And like I said, I mean, certainly we all have our moments as parents where we fall back into that. But like I said, bringing them into that paradigm where, you know, and I go into this more on the back as far as explaining, but talking about, you know, regulation is kind of the key here. And if we can sort of keep that 
that egg on the spoon, as it were, as we go through this visit, you know, if we don't let that egg fall, like it, it's going to go a lot more smoothly because she's regulated. And so again, you know, kind of do's and don'ts. Um, like I said, you know, um, the, the don'ts, please don't talk to her more than necessary. Please don't involve more people than necessary. Please don't offer choices or information that she hasn't asked for or use talk as a distraction. Again, you know, one of the things I think people are used to um, is, is, is trying to be chatty and distract you from, you know, what they're doing that might be uncomfortable. And like I said, there are people for whom that works, but for someone whose brain perceives excess chatter as like fingernails on a chalkboard, I mean, that's horrible. That's like, if they're like, well, we're going to distract you with fingernails on a chalkboard while we draw your blood. And that's kind of how I, you know, it felt to her. And so, you know, the last one, again, please don't take her behavior personally. It's, it's a little wild that we have to say that, but I think it's helpful because um, I certainly have seen, you know, that happen. And again, it tends to be with people who feel like they've really mastered, you know, this treating other people how you want to be treated kind of a thing. And, you know, I've heard it said that's the golden rule, treat other people how you want to be treated, but the, the platinum rule is treat other people how they want to be treated. And so that's what I'm trying to help people move into here is if you're treating her like she wants to be treated, um, you know, you kind of have to put aside what, what you would want or how you feel about it. And like I said, you know, as adults, as clinicians, as intelligent trained people, I think they're capable of it. Um, and so then for the do, you know, please do address questions and conversations to the parent. She'll chime in if she likes. Again, I know that's counterintuitive to a lot of people. And especially as my kids reach middle school age, it's hard because, you know, I'm a nurse midwife. I have a, you know, reproductive health background. I totally get wanting, you know, tweens and teens to have this autonomy and wanting to, you know, that type of thing. But like I said, for my, um, kids in particular, at least so far, especially my youngest, um, it's so overwhelming to her to, to, to have these questions. Like I said, some of which, um, you know, might be clinically relevant and she doesn't know the answer. Some of them might be clinically relevant and kind of sensitive. Some of the rapport building questions, who's your best friend or, you know, when's your birthday and things like that, you know, might also be sensitive topics. Like social stuff is hard. You know, it would be like if rapport building for an adult was like, well, how's your divorce going? Like, what's your relationship like with your ex? It's just like, that's not relaxing. And so to ask kids, like I said, put them on the spot for information that is either difficult or painful for them to recall. And so rather than saying, don't ask this, don't ask that, it's like, just don't, don't go, don't go where she doesn't need you to go, you know? And, and I've also, another common one I see is where people are like, okay, do you want the green cough or the blue cough? And it's just like, she doesn't really care because she doesn't want it done anyway. And like I said, I think we've all reached that point of decision fatigue where you kind of stand in the aisle with all the different kinds of dish soap. And you're like, I don't know. I don't know. Can't there just be like one kind? And, and I think it's similar here where, like I said, I, I get that for some kids that increasing choice helps, but it's like, unless the choices get the heck out of here, like you're not giving her the choice that she wants. And so burdening her down with all of these little minute, like, do you want the Mickey or the Minnie? And do you want to sit over here? Or do you want to sit over there? And so, um, you know, allowing her to stay calm by focusing on videos and headphones, you know, that's a big one. Obviously we've all been screen time shamed, um, whether by ourselves or by other people. And so for a long time, I felt like, you know, okay, well, we'll bring the iPad, but the understanding is, you know, they turn it off as soon as the doctor comes in the room. And what I realized was that was when they needed it most. And so it's, like I said, you know, if that's their comfort, that's their support, to take that away when they really most need it, I'm really not helping anything. And if anything, I've just created a jarring transition, which we know is difficult for a lot of neurodiverse people. And so we've created this jarring transition right as the doctor walks in the room, right as the anxiety ratchets up. And when I realize they can look in her ears while she's watching a video, like they can listen to her heart while she's watching a video, like there's just no reason we can't do it that way. And kind of, again, leading into the next point about granting reasonable requests, where, like I said, don't overwhelm her with choices she doesn't need. But if she's asking you for something, 
don't just say no because it's how you do things, whether that's, you know, not to have a hospital gown or staying upright instead of lying down. In her case, you know, she has PTSD from being held down and intubated and deep suctioned in the ICU. And so anything that requires her to lean back um, in a clinical setting is very triggering and very activating. And so, you know, her dentists and <clears throat> other providers have all gotten very good about managing to do things with her in a seated upright position. Um, and again, you know, these are reasonable requests. I'm not saying we don't go to the dentist or I'm not saying hang upside down and do it that way. You know, it's just, she'd like to sit up instead of lie down. And so rather than making that a conflict where her heart rate quickens and she hears me having to defend that decision and hope that they're going to acquiesce to it. Like I said, just putting in some of those things that help her feel safe, her own clothes versus a hospital gown. And then again, the last one, if she declines something, acquiescing is likely to be more, more successful than insisting. So if they say, let's get your blood pressure and she says no, if people say, okay, all right, well, maybe later then, she'll often go, fine, do it. Whereas if they're like, oh, no, no, we have to do that. And, you know, this kind of a thing, it's like, it just, again, kind of activates that anxiety and that resistance. And so helping people, um, like I said, kind of understand that if the goal is the blood pressure, I get that and we'll find a way to get it. But digging in your heels is going to cause digging in her heels. And so let me kind of help you understand like how it might be helpful to kind of navigate some of those moments. And so then, like I said, at the bottom, kind of summing up again, you know, in a nutshell, what we're working toward, you know, self-regulation and autonomy, trying to heal some of her response to the healthcare environment, because I've told people, you know, how this visit goes, isn't just how this visit goes. This is either going to hurt or help how it goes the next time at the dentist, how it goes the next time at the doctor, you know, as these kids become young adults and, you know, older adults, this is going to affect how they feel for the rest of their lives about seeking medical care. And so, you know, is this going to be a thing where they're comfortable and willing to do that and ask for help? Or is this going to be the kind of thing where they're going to sweep problems under the rug? until they're unnecessarily more complicated because it's so frightening to go in and get care. One of the things that I really like, Katie, is the fact that you, you laid out the do's and don'ts, but like you were saying, is that there, there's times where this seems counterintuitive to what we've been taught to do as people that interact with other people, um, and especially in the healthcare system of, of having that calming environment and establishing rapport. And so I really like the fact that as part of the preference plan, you also include a little bit of the background. Um, why is this important for your daughter and why is it going to work? And I think that shows that, you know, you're not just, you're not just going in there making whimsical suggestions about, you know, well, you know, if you could have all of your thermometers painted red, then everything's exactly. going to go much better for my child. Right. Mm -hmm. No, these are, you have thought through this and you're trying to help them have the best visit possible. Yeah, that's definitely true. And, and again, I think we've all been there where everything that we're doing, you know, there's a difference between path of least resistance because you haven't tried anything else and path of least resistance because you've tried everything, you've researched everything, you've looked into everything. And like, this is kind of the evidence-based, you know, way forward. And so, um, again, that's a lot to try to pack in and explain in a visit. So, like I said, I mean, my goal is that, you know, moving forward, it would be great if every family had the chance to kind of express, you know, here's who we are and here's a little bit on why, you know, if you're interested, um, like I said, I, it probably still, you know, could be, could be briefer, could be more concise, but like I said, I've, I've tried to address, you know, again, kind of a frequently asked questions of, you know, these are all the things that, that we've seen and heard over the years, as far as rebuttals or, you know, well, here's why we do things the way that we do. And like I said, you know, it's not that I don't know that it's just, it's not going to work here. And so again, for the really busy person, if they can just look at the bullets on the front and they don't care about why that's fine. But if there are people that are, 
you know, intrigued by the rationale and things like that, you know, again, my hope is that that plants little seeds as far as, um, you know, individualizing um, and, and tailoring the care that, you know, they give to the next patient and the next patient, even if their, their actual preferences might be different, the ideas, you know, of that self-regulation and self-determination and helping people, you know, understand that, that the way we conduct ourselves, and like I said, ourselves, I guess, again, I'm speaking of healthcare workers, the way that we conduct ourselves in an interaction, it's going to tend to make things better or make things worse. There's not a ton of neutral, I think, for, for neurodiverse people. And so, um, you know, I think to, to put our egos aside and be in that space where we can say, even in words, is there something I'm doing that's making you more anxious? Is there something I could be doing that would make this easier? Um, and and so, using you know, those those observation skills of being able to get out of the, this is the way this visit is going to go. This is what I have to accomplish. This is da 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 da, and actually be present, mm -hmm. and to and and to see how is this and how is it being received, and then working with those partners that are in that room, to say, huh, this doesn't seem to be going well. She's in a corner what can we do to help? Or she just seems to be a little distance. Am I, right. is it something I'm saying something, being self-aware of Definitely. my part of interacting in that, in, in that situation. So I am going to stop sharing and bring us back to a large group and give people a chance to interact and ask questions, if that's okay with you, Katie. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay. So I am going, just give me one moment here. Okay. And we do have a question in the chat of, is there a standardized form available? So what Katie has given me is this example, as well as instructions, and I will get those sent out to you. She's okayed it to be sent out to all you guys. So you will have these physical examples to make your own, um, as well as we'll post it along with this video. So that, and and I'm pretty sure it's adaptable. Yeah, um, it was very back of the <laughs> napkin. Like I said, I mean, if I did it again today, I'd probably do it a little bit differently um, just because that's the way the wind blows. And so, like I said, really the idea was, was giving, um, people again sort of permission you know to to take some time to sort of get back in that headspace of you know how do I advocate for my child how does my child want to be treated because like I said that for me was the cornerstone of the whole thing is how does my child want to be treated not how do I want her to be treated how do they want to treat her but how does my child want to be treated and so like I said there's no wrong way I think to to figure that out and you know we talked a little before about you know, until not, you know, until it was to become a widespread thing, like a lot of families may feel uncomfortable sharing the physical document. It's a lot, it's sticking your neck out there. But like I said, for me, just having completed the process, both within myself and then with my husband, who is, you know, not here during the day with the kids, not present for as many um, medical visits, um, I think it was as helpful for that as anything else, because like I said, it got my head where I wanted it. It got us on the same page to where even if, you know, the physical plan never really saw the light of day, our confidence was there as far as, okay, here are the things that we're planning to highlight and we know why. And if they ask us why we can tell them why. Um, but like I said, you know, that there's really no right or wrong way to do it. There's really no right or wrong way to use it. It's really just, like I said, a kind of a personal exercise um, that of course is also going to evolve, you know, as, as the, the child or, or the person evolves over time, their preferences and their needs. I, I love that sense of evolution too, because I can see where, you know, I have an older son, he's 24 now, where having him involved in talking about the do's and the don'ts mm -hmm. and the preferences is, is helping him become aware of what does he like? What doesn't he like? What, how, yes. how is the best way? And to be able to communicate that mm -hmm. to doctors is really important. And so getting them involved later on um, is also, you know, I can see that as an evolution too of a, of a care preference plan. 
Um, I know that we have some a mixture of parents as well as professionals on the call, and I, I'm just wondering, are there any parents who have similar um, have have had similar struggles or have similar ways to to get over that that whole look at my child as as this individual and let's pattern the the, the visit around them and their their needs their preferences and not just on what we have to get done in the next 10 minutes any other parents or or professionals want to share or ask questions please feel free to unmute or put it in the chat and i will repeat those questions i was just curious is this something that you bring to every single appointment or is this something that is like in your daughter's chart and you might just bring it to like new providers yeah, that's a great question. And like I said, it's actually funny because I made it and I shared it with Sandy and we shared it with other people. And then, like I said, you know, I speak from experience when I say like the morning we went to have her dental surgery, I was like, oh, I don't know, maybe it's kind of weird, maybe it's too much. And so I think we brought it along like I said, just kind of for our own sake, we may have put it up on the whiteboard. I'm trying to remember, you know, at this point, there's not a standardized place for it in the medical record, you know? And so I feel like it would be very easy for it to get lost. And so, um, like I said, at this point, it is kind of more for internal use kind of a thing, you know, within the family. And like I said, you know, we may share it. Um, I could see it being helpful if we had a new provider. Um, and perhaps we will. Um, she's transitioning from a, a male cardiologist to a female cardiologist um, here this summer. And so, you know, that might be a, a place where we, we think about using it. Um, so like I said, I guess I'm a perfect example of, you know, until it becomes a little bit more um, widespread and, and accepted. And like I said, even just as far as having a physical place, you know, now that you don't really have a a paper chart anymore. You can't just put like a sticky note or something like that. It's like it would be like scanned in in the media section. And so people would have to know it was there and go looking for it. And so um, I think, you know, the the burden is still kind of on us as far as sharing the information. I'd love right. to see there be again, you know, a sleeve on the door where you could stick it in, you know, before the provider comes in. Um, and so those are some ideas I, I, you know, throw out there as far as is doing it. But like I said, I think um, your ideas too, you know, you, you could either bring it to every visit if it's a specialist that, you know, sees your child on a fairly irregular basis, or if it's a family doctor that knows them well, you know, probably less important, you know, unless there's been a change. And I like that because it is a living type document. I mean, our do's and don'ts and our preferences change. And so I'm sitting here thinking I have rarely, if ever, checked into an appointment and then had my name called. And so there seems to be this, this sort of waiting gap even during times of COVID. And so what if this was something about, oh, and thank you for checking me in. Could you please make sure the nurse and the doctor get this? This will help the visit go smoother. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully they may be able to at least glance at it and take in some of the do's and don'ts before they call your daughter and your family back in. So another, you know, another thought, but I like that sleeve on the door idea as well. Um, I like that. Barbara, did yeah, you, hi. I saw you unmuted. What would, I what, did. What? I have yeah, a couple welcome. of thoughts. So hi everyone, I'm Barbara Katz from Family Voices. And I'm also the mom of a 30 year old son with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And um, I really appreciate Katie, the information that you share definitely during uh, my son's, uh, my advocacy journey with my son as he's grown up. Um, uh, I have hoped to uh, transfer my advocacy to him so that he could advocate for himself. And um, that doesn't go, that hasn't gone so well so far. So I think that's really tough depending on what the individual's communicative abilities are. Um, but I appreciate, um, you know, Tim, you bringing that up and thinking about that. But a practical suggestion that I had 
uh, for communicating a tool like this is I wonder if you could send it as an attachment to a message in, you know, like my chart or the electronic medical record and said, please have the providers look at this before we come in. And that might be a tool that can be used. Um, the other thing is that a number of providers use these things called shared plans of care, mm -hmm. which are um, sort of um, they take different um, uh, health, different health systems have different versions of them, but in that are um, families preferences and, um, you know, so something like this could be included in a sort of more of a medical um, shared plan of care. Uh, but I think that uh, I really like the short uh, succinct bullets and, you know, what works and what doesn't work. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah, thank you for sharing your thoughts. I think it was the shared plan of care that Sandy had shared with me, if I'm not mistaken. And like you're saying, I think for me, I was like, oh boy, I'm a nurse and I'm finding this a bit overwhelming. And so it was wanting something a little bit more, like you're saying, just, you know, a little more um, concise and personal, you know, to where it was like, it would just be a couple of easily digestible, you know, points, but um, so yeah, that's astute of you to kind of draw that difference. And, and also that, like I said, this one's a little briefer and those types of things, but I like your idea about my chart. I think that's a really good idea. I just wanted to comment too, Barb, that is an excellent idea with the my chart, but I wanted to say from a professional, from a parent aspect, I wish this is something that I would have known when I was, uh, you know, bringing up the kids uh, to involve them in it, because as I was sitting here listening to you, you know, we talk about the transition and them, you know, introducing themselves into the IEP meeting and giving that spiel, you know, because the meeting is about them and involving them in it and, and teaching them to advocate. And it would have been great to have known that, that they could have been advocating at their doctor's appointments, right? So uh, moving forward, I'm excited because I feel like this is a great tool that I want to share with the families as well. So this is all really good information. And now I got the my chart bar right here. <laughs> like, yeah. There, there was also a question in the chat about, you know, who, who have you tried? I mean, do you just save it for the general physician, the medical assistant? Um, do you find that with your appointments that you, there's a point person for each appointment or how, how do you see sure, this? Yeah, that's out? a great question. And like I said, it's funny because I, I made it kind of back of the napkin and then we've had like that one, you know, major appointment and otherwise we've kind of been hunkered down. And so a lot of this is very theoretical for me, but um, I think there's definitely a role for the, you know, the um, auxiliary staff. Cause you know, I've shared before with that with that dental surgery, um, we did have, you know, an MA who was, who was very chatty. And so my husband, you know, followed the plan and he was like, she has autism, you know, she's just going to focus if you could not do the small talk. And so she had kind of MA explained him, you know, about how this is why she does this and it helps the kids relax and it puts them at ease. And so, like I said, it was one of those moments where it's like, but we're telling you that that's not relaxing to her. So again, I think, um, I think there's definitely a role for, for the auxiliary staff, because like I said, I think realistically speaking, sometimes you spend more time with them than you do the provider. And again, they might not have seen you last year, um, like the provider did. I think, you know, there's some more turnover there. And again, I mean, they're busy and I, I completely understand and, and respect that. And that's where, again, you know, we really are here as partners, we all benefit if this goes smoothly and well. It's gonna go much more quickly and efficiently if she stays regulated than if she becomes dysregulated. And so um, again, a work in progress, but definitely I think there is um, a need to, to have those folks on board too, because again, you can certainly like drop the egg of dysregulation way before the doctor ever makes it to the room. True. So it's not going to solve all the problems of the world, um, right. but at least maybe it can help a little bit for, for that next appointment. Other comments, questions, interaction? Signe. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much, Katie. Thank you, Tim. Um, hi, everyone. 
I was wondering if it's something that could be presented as far as getting a standardized form, maybe through CLTS, uh, maybe they have some ideas mm -hmm. on how to put something together where parents can use it as a, as a starting point. I know I may be able to draft uh, and create a, a treatment plan, which I think is a great idea. Um, I just don't know if that could be, um, or what, I'm, what I'm saying is maybe that could be a resource for other parents mm -hmm. that were wrong for whatever reason, something quick and dirty for the time being, and then mm -hmm. you know, um, blossom into something more thorough and concrete for them. But at least they get, you know, the regular, I'm at that vaccine well check stage. My kids are really young. <laughs> Thank you. That's we, we can look into and we have some people that we talk to over at like children's long term supports and, you know, we can see about where else that we could get this idea into the hands of parents. I think that's a great idea. Other questions, comments? Thank you, Mara. Um, Sandy, I know that you know Katie and that you've worked with Katie and you know darn well that I was gonna call on you at some point, but I also know that you're a parent. How does this resonate with, with your experience as a parent? And I know that you, know, you too understand the medical system. Um, through a family connection and you know your your personal life, so how's this resonating with you? Um, I love this tool because I think it does so many things. Like Katie had talked about, it personalizes who this child is and explains what they need and why to be for this this appointment to be successful. Um, I loved her her phrase um, that I'm going to kind of try to paraphrase is like the platinum standard. So the gold standard is sort of the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. But the platinum rule is really do unto others as they would prefer to have done unto them or whatever the language would be for that. Um, because I think that's really the key to this is it's great if I remember to treat you with respect, but my version of what that feels like and looks like could be very different from yours. And this allows that to be communicated um, through some very simple please do's and please don'ts. And then I love that on the back, there's the, and here's the education as to why, because it gives that opportunity for people to dig deeper if they choose to, but the front gives them, what do I need to know in this moment? And so it kind of has that, that dual purpose for people. Um, I've noticed that my husband who is a physician and I were in appointments, he, he falls on the side of like, what are the basic facts that they need to know to accomplish this? Whereas I'm talking about stories of my child and I do that on purpose so that they see my child as a human with all these other pieces and complexities that go with this. And it dawned on me that this is what this tool does also. You know, and it's more succinct than me going into this long explanation of something. So I, I think that that's just a fabulous tool. And that's why I was so excited, Katie, when you shared it with me and we were like, yeah, this needs, people need to know about this, you know? And I'd love that from what I'm seeing is other people are saying, this is really great too. So I think I love the idea of creating something that's more concrete. It's a little bit like a shared plan of care, but it's much more, it's much, just much more than that. And not a lot of people know about a shared plan of care. It's not a I didn't. Yeah, right. And, and you work in a medical setting. Yeah. You, you know, you have experiences in there from as a provider, as well as a parent. So I think that that's, this just really helps with that. So I think it's cool. I'm looking forward to doing it with my daughter who is now 15, because I think it will help her learn how to advocate for herself to be able to kind of summarize what is it that she needs. Um, and I think it will also allow her to think through as she becomes an adult, moves into an adult system, she wants to do, um, um, supported decision making, who would be the people that she wants to come into her, into our appointments with her and what role does she want them to take? And this would help them with that. So it's, I but think. It's there, so are you thinking there may be a time where your daughter doesn't want you in with her appointment with her doctors that. Oh, hmm, she hmm. told me years ago, years ago, and I wish I could tell you how many, but I'm not sure, but she told me years ago that, um, she knows how this goes and she knows <laughs> I think she was having, she was getting her baclofen pump refilled. So she's very confident in that now. And she's like, I don't need you. 
I just need you to drive me. And I said, well, ah. somebody has to also like, if there's official things to be signed, she's like, fine. And you can come and sign paperwork, but I can do this on my own. And I think this is great because it's going to help. It's going to give us an opportunity to talk through what do you need to be able to do this on exactly. your own? It really solidifies that and makes that very concrete for her and for me. So we can have a more guided discussion um, that's mm -hmm. relevant versus me kind of, oh, wait, what about this? What about this? It's just, it's more structured. Love it. Well, we are at our end of time. Oh, Signe, did you want to say something else? Go for it. I love that idea. I think I'm going to take that back to APS. For those who don't know, I'm uh, assistant corporation counsel. I do all the guardianships and protective placements for Dane County um, and supportive decision making. We do try to push that endeavor, but I love this idea. I will definitely take it back to APS. Fantastic. Well, thank you all for being here. If you have a moment to hop and give us a little bit of feedback, uh, people love to know whether I'm actually doing anything useful in my job. So that'd be great. Katie, thank you so much for opening up and sharing your family with us. We really do appreciate it. Any final words for us on the care preference plan? I don't think so. Just that it was great to hear from everybody. And, you know, again, I think especially nowadays, it's really easy to feel like an island. And so, like I said, it was definitely a highlight for me to, um, to hear from some other folks, you know, walking the same walk and other ideas and things like that. So it's, you know, it's been great. So I really appreciate you opening up the opportunity and Sandy, and like I said, everybody else that's here and, and spoke up too. It was just a really nice, a nice day. Oh, and we will get the 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 forms, as it were, um, the back of the napkin thoughts um, out to everybody, and we'll get it posted with the video, and hopefully it will grow and, and become even a more useful tool for everyone. So thank you so much. Um, have a great rest of your day. You do the same. Bye-bye.